Hello class, today we are talking about sociological research, which will conclude module 1. Doing research is a huge part of being a sociologist. As a matter of fact, in college, sociology only started making sense to me when I became involved in research. It was like an epiphany. Suddenly I realized that I could scientifically study and understand society. It was exciting. So, in my previous lecture, I encourage you to compare and contrast our common sense statements with actual research findings by sociologists. Now, we'll take a very scrupulous look at how exactly those research findings are obtained. Of course, we want to make sure that they are real scientific facts and not some pseudoscience or subjective opinions. So, we'll begin by examining the connection between theory and practice in order to understand the nature of scientific method. I'll give you a little bit of history behind the creation of science. I'll then walk you through the main steps in scientific research. Uh, next, we'll study research design, what the major sociological research methods are, and which ethical guidelines exist for researchers. It's part of the larger sociological code of ethics. This here is our Bible, so to speak. Considering that in this course I'll give you plenty of extra credit applied research opportunities, it's quite important that you are familiar with research ethics. Let's start this lecture. What is the scientific method? Theory and Practice In true genuine science, theory and practice are inseparable. Too often, however, when taking a class, students may ask themselves, well, how does it apply to real world? All this theory is boring. It is unfortunate when this connection is not made clear. Therefore, I want you to remember these two quotes. The first one says, theory without practice is dead. Practice without theory is blind. Think about it. No one likes listening to some ranting that has no practical use, right? The goal of theory is to explain the reality, to tell us how things work. Now, during the Middle Ages, scholars really enjoyed listening to themselves talk and would spend hours in futile debates. You know what? If God is really omnipotent, then he should be able to create a rock that he cannot lift. But if there is a rock that God cannot lift, then he is not really omnipotent, is he? Do you find any practical use in such arguments? So, theory without practice is dead, useless, boring. On the other hand, practice without theory is blind. How would you like to be operated on by a surgeon who never went to school, who never once opened a textbook. And that's actually how surgeries were done in the past, by trial and error method, or blindly. And that's part of the reason why life expectancy was half of what it is now. Or imagine that you just purchased some complicated electronic equipment, but didn't get the user's manual with it. You are blind without it. You may spend hours or even days on different internet forums searching for help and still won't be able to set it up correctly. The second quote says, Practice is the only source of theory and the only means of theory verification. In science, researchers develop theories because there is a practical problem that needs to be resolved. Why is hot air lighter than cold air? Why do people get cancer? What causes economic recessions? These are all practical questions that need and can be answered through the scientific method. And how do we know that theories are correct? We can verify them by going back to practice. So this is how this triangle works. It begins with practice, where we identify some practical issues that we want to study. Then we collect empirical data based on which we develop a theory. Others can verify this theory by going back to practice, which means replicating the original research or simply applying theory to everyday life. If we receive consistent results, then we accept this theory. 
The process itself is never ending. And as soon as we discover some inconsistency, new problems and new data, old theories will be modified or replaced with new ones. For example, in neuroscience, it was once thought that cells of our nervous system could not regenerate. Now new evidence suggests that they can. In sociology, the theory of social Darwinism, claiming that rich people were biologically superior, was once very popular. Now it's not. If we break this triangle, then it's not science anymore. If you ask a question that has no practical relevance, tomorrow I will be different than I am today. So then will it still be me or will it be somebody else? It's not science, it's philosophy. If you try to explain something but it's not based on any empirical data and cannot be verified, the reason people get cancer is because God is warning us that the end of the world is near. Then it's not science either. It's religion. There is a separate place for philosophy and religion, but they are profoundly different from science. Not inferior, just different. And they serve a very different purpose in society too. As one German philosopher put it, Science is organized knowledge, but philosophy is organized life. So here we are going to focus on the scientific method only. When did it first appear? Who pioneered the scientific method? Interestingly enough, the scientific method was introduced not that long ago. Among the people credited with laying the foundation of modern science is Francis Bacon, a prominent English statesman and philosopher. He served as the Lord Chancellor, but was later fired on charges of bribery. It proved to be a blessing in disguise for humanity, because having all that extra time on his hands, he wrote his famous Novum Organum, from Latin, The New Instrument. This book proposed a new vision of scientific knowledge that is based on observation and experiment that became known as the inductive method. What it means is that before real science emerged, people thought that the true knowledge could be obtained through the power of imagination and logic. It seems hard to believe now, but in the past, scholars would debate each other about how many teeth a horse had. And it never occurred to them that they should go open its mouth and count its teeth. By relying on imagination and seemingly rational thinking, in the past, doctors treated virtually any physical disease by bloodletting, or with tobacco smoke enemas. Mental illness required more serious measures, such as drilling holes in one's skull, so that the evil spirits could escape. To cure syphilis, adults were recommended to have sex with young children. Bathing was strongly discouraged, as it would mess up the balance of four humors in one's body such as blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, and cause disease. Sleeping with your mouth open was considered even more dangerous, as it would allow your soul to escape. Women used beaver's testicles as a neural contraceptive, and burning witches was commonplace because everyone knew they were causing droughts and eating babies. Yes, that's what we were doing before we had signs. So, the inductive method required to collect empirical data through observation and experiment and only then make generalized conclusions. It was no longer acceptable to just make up things. Next we're going to talk about specific steps in scientific research. Step 1. Define the problem. Clearly identify what you set out to research Make sure that the scope of your research is realistic, not too wide and not too narrow, and explain why your research is important, interesting, and practical, especially if you need to secure external funding. Step 2. Review the literature. Why waste your time at the library when you can start doing your research right away? Actually, your whole research may end up being a waste of time if you skip this important step. First of all, somebody may have already researched this exact problem, so you'll avoid unnecessary duplication. And second of all, 
your predecessors may have done similar research, which now allows you to use their work as your methodology. In other words, you can use similar methods and techniques, rely on some secondary data, and maybe even invite the same group of volunteers as opposed to designing your research completely from scratch. Step 3. Operationalize key concepts, identify variables, and formulate hypotheses. Operationalization is the process of defining an abstract concept so as to make it clear, specific, and measurable. Operationalization is a big word, but it simply means to be specific. Let's say, for instance, your friend asks you, do you want to do something fun this weekend? And you respond, operationalize fun, please. By fun, do you mean bowling, fishing, camping, going to a bar, or maybe going to the movies? Be specific. Now, to give you a concrete example, as a student in my Sociology of Deviance class, I had to research some kind of deviant behavior. So I picked truancy. I wanted to know why students skip school. But where do I start? Obviously, I had to operationalize truancy. Consequently, I broke it down to such things as student family background, classroom socio-psychological environment, teaching styles, number of absences, instances of student abuse, age of students, etc. This procedure in turn allows me to identify those variables that I'm going to measure and formulate my hypotheses, which are assumptions or predictions about the relationship between my variables. It's my educated guess. So I took such variables as family dysfunction, age of students, rigid teaching style, and student abuse, and predicted that as the values for these variables go up, so does the frequency of absences. In other words, the more family dysfunction, the more absences from school. The older the student, the more truancy. The more unaccommodating the teacher, the more absenteeism. And the worse the socio-psychological environment in school, the lower the attendance rate. One thing to remember about your hypotheses is that you are going to test them and not try to prove them no matter what. It is important to maintain objectivity, or as Max Weber called it, value neutrality, throughout your research. Even if your hypothesis turns out to be wrong, it is still an important scientific finding. Step 4. Research Design and Field Stage now you need to decide which research methods will work the best in your situation. This is the step where you ensure the validity of your research, meaning that you measure what you intend to measure, and the reliability of your research, meaning that your procedure for collecting data yields consistent results. For example, if I claim that in my research I studied why truancy happens, but instead I ended up discussing how truancy affects one's chances of getting into college, then my research is not valid. If, for instance, I'm using the survey method and design my scales improperly, then the data will be unreliable. So let's say I ask students to indicate how often they miss school and give them only two choices, not too often and quite often. Obviously, this is a very subjective measure, and students can change their responses a lot, thus giving me inconsistent results. Therefore, it's a good idea to pilot your research methods before proceeding to the field stage. Step 5. Analyze data and develop conclusions. Now, the data you have collected can be processed on the computer, oftentimes using specialized software such as SPSS, which stands for Statistical Package for Social Sciences. You will discuss your research findings and make your conclusions. Step 6. Finally, you will proudly publish your results so that other scholars can discuss, replicate, use, or try to disprove them. All in all, your research becomes part of a scientific discourse that contributes to the development of new theories, 
or modification and replacement on the old ones. Time for a hands-on activity. Suppose we are at step 5 in our research where we analyze data. Let's take a look at three most common statistical measures that are used by researchers to describe the average. The mean is the sum of all values in the data set divided by the number of values. The median is the middle value in the data set. And the mode is the value that occurs most often in the data set. Let's say you surveyed five of your friends about the number of pets each of them has. The numbers you received are 1, 1, 2, 3, and 6. This is your data set. In this data set, the mean number of pets is the sum of all values 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 6 which equals 13 divided by the number of values which is 5 so the mean number of pets is 2.6 by looking at our data set we can conclude that this is a pretty representative number if you say that on average your friends have 2.6 pets, it will be a reasonable estimate. What is the median number of pets? If we look at our data set, we see that the middle value in the data set is 2. Median. This is also a fairly representative number and you can say that your friends own on average 2 pets. And what is the modal number of pets? The values that occurs most often in this data set is 1. Mode. As you can see, this is not a very good average to describe your data set, as most of your friends have more than one pet. Well, which average do you think sociologists typically use? The most commonly used statistical measure is the median. It is the least likely to be distorted. You just saw how the mode ended up not being a very representative average. The mean can also be distorted if there are unusually high or unusually low values in the data set. For example, we know that the GDP, gross domestic product, per capita in the United States is about $50,000. This number describes the sum of the nation's wealth divided by the number of people who live in this country. However, would it be representative to say that the average income for a family of four in the United States is $200? thousand dollars. Of course not. The reason we are getting this number is because the United States has the largest number of billionaires in the world. Their disproportionately high income makes the mean income look very high. So instead we use the median household income which also happens to be around $50,000. This is a much more realistic figure to describe the average income for a family of four. That's why the median is used the most, although there are times when the mean and the mode should be used. So to practice using these three statistical measures, your homework will be to calculate average fertility rates in your extended family.
take at least three family structures, such as your own, your parents, your siblings, your grandparents, or your aunts and uncles, and find the mean, the median, and the modal number of children in your extended family. By the way, it doesn't matter whether the child was acquired by birth or adoption. Then compare these numbers to the current total fertility rate in the United States. To help you, I'll use my family as an example. My parents had two children, and my wife's parents had two children. My brother had one child, and my wife's sister had three children. My paternal grandparents had three children, and my maternal grandparents had two children. My wife's paternal grandparents had two children and my wife's maternal grandparents had, are you ready, 14 children. So in this data set, the mean number of children is 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 plus 14 divided by 8 which equals 3.6. Is this a representative average? No. Everybody in my family but my wife's maternal grandparents had three or fewer children. They're the ones who distort the mean in this data set. The middle value in this data set is 2. And the most common value is also two. So both the median and the mode for this data set are two. It's a representative number and therefore I'm going to say that the average fertility rate in my extended family is two. How does it compare to the US total fertility rate. Search the internet to find out. Next we are going to talk about major sociological methods. A. Naturalistic observation. It's a systematic observation and recording of social behaviors as they occur in their natural environment. So the major advantage of this method is that it allows us to watch people behave naturally since they don't feel like they're being studied. My social work internships where for about a month I had to watch and record everything that was happening within the agency were perfect examples of naturalistic observation. Although the staff members knew there was an intern, they went about their business as usual. Now, the downside of this method is that we don't know when exactly the behaviors we want to observe are going to happen. So, waiting for those behaviors and properly documenting them is a challenge. For example, there were a few times when I wanted to observe a counseling session with a client, but it never happened. This method may also be fraught with ethical dilemmas, especially in participant observation as researchers do not always obtain informed consent from the people they watch, and therefore it may feel deceptive. Before I started teaching in the United States, I enrolled in several classes just to get a feel for the American college experience. Well, I failed to mention to the instructors that, in essence, this was a participant observation, and that next semester I would be their colleague. Consequently, whenever we met on campus, they tried to look away. B. Surveys. These are questionnaires or interviews designed to investigate the behaviors, attitudes, and opinions of large populations. This is where sociologists shine. They are the masters of surveys and quite openly ridicule psychological questionnaires as completely unreliable and pseudoscientific. If you ever took a psychological test, 
you may have noticed that answer options are limited and your results may be different every time you take the test. This is unacceptable to a sociologist. The major advantage of this method is that it allows us to study large populations. But the challenge here is generalizability. If we survey a couple hundred or even thousand people, how can we claim that their opinions correctly reflect those of the whole country? That's over 300 million people. So to ensure generalizability, we need a representative sample. That's why there are entire groups of professionals who specialize just in this area, creating survey samples using various methods of statistical probability. Other challenges include developing sensitive scales, avoiding confusing and suggestive questions, finding trustworthy interviewers, and making sure that questionnaires are filled out correctly and fully. I used to work as both an interviewer and a coder, and I have seen my fair share of ruined questionnaires. When using surveys, observation, or other methods, researchers oftentimes discover various correlations. It is very easy to do with SPSS as the computer can automatically analyze all research variables for statistically significant correlations. There are some pretty well-known correlations such as long-term smokers tend to develop lung or pancreatic cancer. People who play violent video games are also more likely to be violent in real life. Women tend to vote Democrat and men tend to vote Republican and so forth. And then there are some less known and peculiar correlations. For example, it has been discovered that avid dog lovers tend to look just like their dogs. Have you ever noticed that? It's true. So now the question is, why does this happen? If I get a dog, does it necessarily mean that five years from now I will look just like my dog? I certainly wouldn't want that to happen. To address such concerns, we have another research method at our disposal. C. Experiment. If we want to know if changes in one variable, in our case dog ownership, cause an effect on another variable, your appearance, then we design an experiment. It's important to remember that this is the only research method that allows us to examine correlations and establish cause and effect relationships between variables. Earlier I said that sociologists are the masters of surveys. Now I must mention that psychologists are the masters of experiments. Some of the most famous experiments that we use in sociology were done by social psychologists. Perhaps it's because this method requires a lot of mind games and psychologists are decidedly better at it. Anyway, let's talk about correlations and how we can determine whether or not they are cause and effect relationships. Quite simply, a correlation shows that two variables are related. Having a dog and looking like your dog are two related variables. But let's use a different and a little bit more sociological example of observed correlation here. In situations of social pressure, people tend to follow the behaviors of others. First of all, correlations are divided into two types, positive and negative. It doesn't mean good or bad. Positive correlation means that two variables vary in the same direction. The more, the more. Or the less, the less. Negative correlation means that two variables vary in the opposite direction. The more, the less. Or, the less, the more. When SPSS calculates correlation quotients for your variables, anything close to plus one 
indicates a very strong positive correlation. And anything close to minus 1 means a very strong negative correlation. Now, using our example, in situations of social pressure, people tend to follow the behaviors of others. Is it a positive or a negative correlation? If we paraphrase it a little, we could say, the more social pressure people experience, the more likely they are to conform. So obviously, it's a positive correlation, right? The more, the more means that our variables vary in the same direction. In other words, as values for our first variable, level of social pressure, increase, so do the values for our second variable, level of conformity. How about the less you study, the more likely you are to fail this class? What type of correlation is this? It's negative. Not because it's a bad thing to do, which it is, but because our variables, the study time and the failure rate, vary in the opposite direction. The less, the more. As values for the study time decrease, values for the failure rate increase. Now, to visualize how variables can vary in different directions or how their values are increasing and decreasing, let's take a look at the following graphs. Your task is to identify which type of correlation it is, positive or negative. Graph A, what type of correlation do you think it is? Positive correlation. You can see that the values are increasing on both axes. How about graph B? It's a negative correlation. Values increase on one axis and decrease on the other axis. And finally, graph C, what type of correlation is it? Well, clearly there is no correlation at all. All right, so we have observed this correlation that when there is social pressure, people tend to follow the behaviors of others. Now we want to determine if there is a cause and effect relationship. Our educated guess, or our hypothesis, is that increased conformity is an effect of stronger social pressure. In other words, stronger social pressure causes increased conformity. We design an experiment where the level of social pressure is going to be our independent variable the one we're going to manipulate because we think it will produce change. And the level of conformity is going to be our dependent variable, the one we will observe and measure. Please remember these terms. Think about all the experiments you do every single day. Will frequent application of fertilizer, independent variable, make my lawn greener, dependent variable? Will using my car's cruise control, independent variable. Improve my vehicle's fuel efficiency, dependent variable. Will flossing twice a day, independent variable. Make my gums healthier, dependent variable. Yes, indeed, you constantly manipulate one variable and observe the other in order to establish cause and effect relationships. So, is there a cause and effect relationship between levels of social pressure and levels of conformity? Of course there is. There have been countless conformity experiments that showed how easily we give in to peer pressure, including this elevator experiment slash prank. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man 
has apparently been in groups before. You're welcome to try this experiment for extra credit. But what about that other correlation where avid dog lovers tend to look just like their dogs? Is that a cause and effect? Does having a dog actually cause you to look like your dog? The answer is no. It's an accidental or spurious correlation. There is a third factor involved. Who picked out the dog? Apparently, People tend to choose dogs that resemble themselves. But if someone else chose the dog, perhaps as a birthday present, then this correlation disappears. So the important conclusion here is that correlation does not necessarily mean cause and effect. Too many times there are other variables that are responsible for such accidental correlations. Let's see. As the number of churches increases, so does the amount of neighborhood crime. Does religion cause high crime rates? No. The third variable that is responsible for this correlation is the number of people living in a city. A larger population leads to more churches and more crime. People who sleep with their shoes on tend to wake up with a headache. Does wearing your shoes to bed cause a headache? No. People just shouldn't get drunk. So the method of experiment allows us to control all other variables and eliminate spurious correlations. Although we are not going to conduct experiments now, I would like you to look at these correlations and try to guess if they are cause and effect relationships or spurious correlations. Pause the video for a couple of minutes and then resume to see the answers. Alright, what do we have? The more people weigh, the greater their salaries. Cause and effect? Do they put you on a scale during your job interview to determine your salary? No, it's obviously a spurious correlation. Well, what is the third variable that produces this correlation? It's age. With age, metabolism slows down and people gain weight. At the same time, with age, people gain more education and work experience, which results in higher salaries. The colder the winter, the greater the number of births next fall. When I mention this correlation in class, my students laugh and say that this is cause and effect. Why? Do cold temperatures boost fertility? Can someone get pregnant by getting a soda from the fridge? No, it's a spurious correlation too. What is the third variable here? It's spending more time in the warm bed when it's cold outside. Next, the more violent media we consume, the more aggressive we become. Some people claim that this correlation exists simply because those who are already violent choose to consume violent media. However, experiments in social learning have proven that this, in fact, is causation, especially if we're talking about video games. Finally, what do we need to keep in mind about experimental design? It's important to have a procedure that ensures random selection of participants in order to avoid false results. For example, when studying the bystander effect, having just females or just males in the experimental group can significantly alter the results. People of both sexes, all ages, and uh, various educational, religious, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds should all have an equal chance of being included in this study. Placebo control group is used to prevent expectancy results. Unlike with a naturalistic observation, in an experiment people know they are being studied. 
which can oftentimes change their behaviors. So how do we know if the independent variable is causing any change? We would have the experimental group that receives the real treatment and the control group that receives a fake treatment or placebo with participants not knowing which group they're in. For example, if we wanted to know if drinking coffee can improve mental performance, we would give regular coffee to the experimental group and uh, decaf coffee to the control group and then compare their results. Many times experiments use the double-blind procedure to exclude demand characteristics. This means that neither the participants nor the person who gives them instructions know the real purpose of the experiment. Otherwise, there is a legitimate concern that somebody will be able to guess what the experiment is about through subtle nonverbal cues. Confederates are the experimenters' employees who pretend to be ordinary participants and guide the experiment in the necessary direction. The elevator experiment I showed you had only one real participant at a time, and the rest were confederates. As you can see, there is plenty of deception that must be used when designing an experiment. And one more research method for today is D, content analysis, which is a uniquely sociological invention. Unlike other ways of collecting data, this one is purely quantitative, which means studying the content of recorded human communication, such as books, video and audio recordings, websites, paintings, laws, etc. Basically, it's just counting words, phrases, images, and other units of information to get a very general idea about a certain topic. Researchers cannot obtain any in-depth or detailed information with it, answer why and how things occur. However, it does allow them to quickly analyze very large samples. So typically it would be used in preliminary research stages while defining the problem, reviewing the literature, and formulating hypotheses. To illustrate how this method works, let's watch a one-minute video clip from the 2006 State of the Union address. This clip contains the most commonly used words from that speech, which gives you a general idea what the president was talking about. NBC News, the State of the Union Address. The enemies of freedom, danger, tyranny, September the 11th, murder and destruction, terrorists, weapons of mass destruction, terror, freedom, 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 perversion, terror, and death, terrorist mass murder, weapons of mass murder, attacks against America, terrorists, the weapon of fear, and they murder children, terrorist freedom. Vicious attackers are enemies of evil. Death camps, evil empire, terror networks, terror freedom. Terrorist to the enemy, freedom. Our enemy is brutal. Terrorist to death in prison. Our enemies, fear. Killed, killed, death. Terror and terrorists, hatred and fear. Freedom, terrorism, terrorist threats. Freedom, free, dangers, enemies. Genocide, terrorism, suffering and chaos. Terrorism, the enemy of September the 11th. Conspiracy, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda. Terrorist, terrorist attacks. Al-Qaeda, terror networks. Freedom, a dramatically more dangerous and anxious world. Freedom, war, freedom. Feed people's fears. Fear of freedom, our culture is doomed to unravel. May God bless America. So can you guess what the general message of that speech was? Have you noticed which words are frequently used by politicians today? You can also complete an extra credit assignment using the method of content analysis to get a general idea about modern cultural values in America and other countries. It involves counting certain words on the internet. We conclude this lecture with research ethics. <laughs> As I mentioned at the beginning, they are part of general ethical principles followed by sociologists, such as professional competence, integrity, professional and scientific responsibility, respect for people's rights, dignity and diversity, and social responsibility. 
With regards to research, sociologists must maintain objectivity, remain impartial, and have no bias or agenda other than scientific truth about our society. Informed consent and voluntary participation are important, although it may be challenging with naturalistic observation and experiment, as a certain amount of deception is always present. Using students as participants may be an issue when university professors strongly encourage their students to participate in exchange for extra credit. First of all, students are not paid for their work, and second of all, they are not a representative sample of the general population. Subjects' rights to privacy and dignity is another ethical issue, as a lot of the most famous groundbreaking experiments such as Stanley Milgram's Obedience to Authority study, Philip Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment, and even Dr. Harry Harlow's Monkey Studies would not be allowed under the modern ethical code. Researchers are also required to maintain confidentiality of records, provide information about the study, and hold a debriefing session with all the participants in the end. Don't forget to do this last step, especially if you choose to conduct a famous experiment on breaching social reality, which is one of your extra credit options for this course. We are now finished with Module 1, What Do Sociologists Study? And you're ready for Quiz 1.